All right, let's switch gears now and start talking about how um, people assess body fat percentage. And we're not gonna show how to do each one of these, but we're gonna talk about the pros and cons quickly of each one so you can determine which one may be a, a good one to use in different situations. All right, so this is a list of some of the most common methods of doing body fat uh, assessment or body composition assessment. There are certainly other ones out there, a lot that I'm not uh, showing on here, like uh, MRI, ultrasound, um, various 3D scans of the body. Um, there's a lot of them. This is something that is consistently getting new techniques developed. Um, but again, these are the common ones. So dual energy x-ray absorptiometry or DEXA, um, that is probably the current gold standard for this, um, excluding MRI, which is probably as good, if not a little bit better than uh, the DEXA, but it's not used outside of research settings often because it's so expensive. Even DEXA is typically only used in clinical or research settings, which is why it's, uh, it's useful as a gold standard to compare the results of some of these other ones too. Um, but it's, it's good for assessing body fat percentage, uh, of course, but also lean tissue because it can see the lean tissue, it can see bone, it can see mineral, it can see fat mass. Um, next one on the list, hydrostatic or underwater weighing. This was the gold standard for a very long time. Underwater weighing um, is still a good measurement. Um, it's not used as frequently as it used to because um, it's uh, been sort of surpassed by uh, DEXA is, and also the next one on this list here, which is air displacement plethysmography. Um, the only system I'm aware of for air displacement plethysmography is the BOD pod system. It's, it's fairly common in your high-end facilities and your academic and research facilities. Um, both of these measurements, as well as the skin fold measurement that we're going to talk about in a second, are going to um, calculate body density. And from body density, you can calculate body fat using an equation similar to the Siri equation I have listed here. But there are other equations that will also go from body density to body fat. Um, so these are not actually body fat measurements, they're body density measurements. But again, we're, we typically use them to assess body fat. All right, so. The next one, as I already quickly mentioned, was skin folds, measuring the subcutaneous fat under the skin by pinching the person. Um, and then biological impedance analysis, or BIA, um, is another one uh, that's uh, commonly done. And it, it, it's going to determine um, how much fat the person has. Also, it's very useful for estimating how much uh, body water the person has. And um, these two down here are your typical um, field or gym based measurements where these ones up here are uh, usually uh, only going to be seen in very high end facilities or research or clinical settings. Um, but we're going to talk about each one of these in a little more detail. So DEXA here, the dual energy x-ray absorptiometry, and you can see an image that you would get from DEXA machine. Um, you can see the skeleton. This was originally used uh, only for, or maybe not only for, but it was originally designed in order to measure bone density, and it's still used for this all the time in clinical settings. But as you can see in the second picture, you can also look at tissues, uh, so your soft tissues. And so you, based on the sort of density of the, the coloring here, you can sort of pick out fats versus lean tissues, and um, you can even see the lungs in here. And so it's useful for looking at um, soft tissues as well. And this is what a, a typical DEXA machine looks like. Um, it's got this wand that's kind of sort of scan um, over the person or a specific segment of the person um, using x-ray type uh, waves. And so um, again, you can get all kinds of different measurements from this. This is just a short segment of what you can get. Some of the pros to this, uh, again, it quantifies bone as well as the soft tissues. So it can give you a measure of bone density, which is uh, health for health reasons is, is very useful, um, which clinically is probably more common to use DEXA for that rather than body fat percentage. Um, Highly precise, highly reliable, which is why it is that gold standard. And I had it with the three different stars on the, the previous slide. Uh, some cons to DEXA, very, very expensive. Um, so these machines are probably going to be starting somewhere around $35,000 a piece. Um, and they can go up into you know well over $100,000, $200,000 if you want sophisticated measurements from them. Um, another uh, issue with DEXA is it does use a low dose of um, radiation. 
uh, it is based on x-rays, which gives radiation. So um, some states are going to uh, make it very difficult to use a DEX machine, others will not. Um, currently, New Jersey, which is where I'm at at the moment, um, is a, a state that highly regulates DEXA, and you need to have a special um, education and license in order to run a DEXA machine. If I go over the border into Pennsylvania, the rules are much more liberal there about DEXA machines, and basically anybody can learn how to use it in a few minutes and then use it on people. Um, so it's much more commonly used in states like that because of the, the looser regulations. Um, I don't know the exact numbers here, but when I've talked to people um, from companies that make these uh, types of machines, now keep in mind it's coming from someone who sells them the equipment, but I've been told that the dose of radiation would be equivalent to eating like a you know four bananas or something like that because the bananas have potassium that has a radioactive component to it. Um, so we're talking about a very very low dose of radiation in most DEXA machines, um, and so it's probably not a, a big concern. But um, again, some governmental bodies have decided to regulate it uh, pretty tightly, so it's not is easily accessible in some states as others. Here's our underwater weighing or hydrostatic weighing. For this, you'd weigh the person on dry land. You'd have to assess their um, how much volume is in their lungs because you're always gonna have a little bit of trapped air that has to be uh, taken into account um, here. And then you put them underwater and you weigh what uh, weigh them under the water. You, so you see the difference in their weight on dry land versus uh, wetland. Uh, or underwater, and from that we're able to calculate body density. Um, it's basically a displacement measurement because you're displacing water, and how much water you displace is going to determine your buoyancy in the water. Um, so, um, sort of basic understanding here: uh, muscle is heavier than water, fat is lighter than water. So, if you have more body fat, you're going to float more. You're going to look lighter underwater. Then if you have less body fat or, or more muscle mass, you would, you would sink more. Um, that's the very basics of this. Um, so some of the limitations of hydrostatic weighing is it does have the confounding effect of air volume that's in your lungs because air also causes buoyancy and causes you to float, uh, which is why when you go under the water, you have to blow out as much air as you can, but you still have residual volume of air in your lungs that you can't get out. It's always trapped in your lungs. That's normal. That's part of normal, healthy pulmonary uh, physiology. So there's always a little bit of air trapped, which is why you need to either measure the residual volume of the person or estimate it through some form of uh, voluntary uh, expiratory uh, capacity test. Some other pretty obvious limitations, hopefully that aren't listed here, is that you are being forced to go underwater, so you're um, you're getting wet. You're typically wearing a um, bathing suit, so that might make some people uncomfortable. Um, when you're under the water and you're blowing out all your air, a lot of people do start to get a little um, uh, claustrophobic. The, the tanks tend to be pretty small, as you can see here, and they kind of need to be to keep the water stable and not have it sort of. Uh, bouncing around and making waves that make it hard to read the, the weights. Um, so all those things can be uh, things that make some people nervous when they're having this test done and um, might make it unpleasant for them. All right, so uh, this, uh, as I already mentioned, is a hydro, uh, the hydrostatic weighing test is a body density test, not a body fat percentage test. And so I have it listed here as a limitation because you have to do a conversion from body density to body fat, which isn't a big deal. It's pretty easy. You know, it's like a couple step or uh, equation or something like that. Um, but everybody's body density is a little different. So if you assume a certain body density for a person and you end up being wrong, it can lead to errors in the body fat percentage calculation. And this is going to be an issue with any of the body density based um, body fat uh, assessment uh, measurements. So um, it's not just this one that has the issue. All right, so um, again, fat-free density does vary amongst uh, different people. On to air displacement plethysmography. Uh, again, BODPOD is 
the only method of this that I'm aware of. Uh, if you know of uh, another machine out there that does this, uh, I would love to know about it. So you know, put a comment below so I can I can learn about it. Um, but bod pods are fairly common. They they're uh, in a lot of high end fitness facilities and athletic facilities, and they're in a lot of research and academic institutions. Um, this is the bod pod. Um, you can see it's got this sort of egg shape to it. Um, it uses similar concepts as underwater wing, but instead of displacing water and measuring your buoyancy, you're displacing air and there's a sort of bladder behind him. Uh, there's behind this wall here that's going to be able to assess the, the volume of the air that you're displacing. Um, and so um, it, it's got those same issues with, you know, you're measuring body density here again. And, um, uh, the various issues associated with uh, going from body density to body fat percentage. Uh, it is much easier for these uh, the participants than underwater wing because they don't need to get wet. They don't have to blow out all their air. You do have to assess air volume in some way uh, in their lungs, uh, the, the volume, um, or do some sort of uh, general uh, prediction equation, which is uh, probably more common. Um, but uh, it is much easier on the person than underwater weighing is. Um, so um, there's that benefit. Some of the negative sides though is uh, you do have to wear minimal clothes um, and uh, you really should cover or uh, shave off any hair that is exposed um, because anything that traps air is going to in, uh, actually increase the error of the test. So notice he has a, a cap on his head uh, compressing his hair. Um, he should have his hair on his chest shaved. Um, we, we didn't in this case, but typically you, you should, especially if it's like a, a, a clinical or research measurement where you need uh, a lot of accuracy to it. Um, you can't see it, but he's wearing compression shorts, obviously has his shirt off. Um, so women would have some sort of sports bra or bathing suit on while doing this, similar to what would be done with the underwater wing. Also, fairly expensive. These machines are going to cost you somewhere between probably fifty and $55,000 to buy. So not something that your typical um, general fitness facility is going to be able to afford. So we've talked a lot about different uh, methods of doing body fat percentage assessment, but up until now, all the techniques I've talked about were lab-based techniques. I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to another video where I talk about field-based techniques.